title of chapter 13 is Writing a Classical Argument. I kind of wish it was Writing a Public Argument, since that's the name of the assignment we're working on. But I understand why they call the chapter what they do. And I also understand what that term, a classical argument, has to do with some of the other strange features in this chapter. Um, there's some Greek words, ethos and pathos, things that, that terms you may have heard before, and then some Latin terms in the section on logical fallacies that you may not have heard before. Now, I'm sure that you guys enjoy Greek and Latin just as much as I do, uh, but you may wonder why those terms are there and what they have to do with the idea of a classical argument. In fact, you may wonder what a classical argument is overall. And that term classical, uh, it's it's kind of related to the idea of a cla like classical music meaning really old, but it's actually more specific than that. The term classical in this context refers to, well, the ancient Greek and Roman world. Um, and the reason this is a chapter on writing a classical argument is that a lot of the rules for argumentation, a lot of ideas about how you argue and what makes an argument effective, come from this period, specifically from guys you've heard of before, most importantly, the philosopher Aristotle. It was Aristotle, for example, who came up with the idea of ethos, pathos, and logos. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about those terms. But the basic idea there is that when you're trying to convince an audience, you can either appeal to their sense of authority. In other words, if they trust you, or uh, often in, in the modern world, it's really if they trust your sources, I suppose, if the, 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 the source material seems authoritative, or if you personally have some authority, then you're going to be more convincing. Uh, pathos being the idea of appealing to emotion. In other words, if you get the emotions of an audience engaged, they're much more likely to, well, they're much easier to be persuaded, I guess, at that point. And finally, logos being an appeal to logic or reason or uh, uh, using the, the kinds of things that we've already been talking about in this chapter, audience-based reasons, uh, for example, refer at least in part to the idea of using logic or evidence. Uh, things like facts and t statistics, etc., to convince your audience. Well, these old thinkers, Aristotle included, also realized that there were ways of arguing, ways of convincing an audience specifically, that weren't really fair, weren't really proper, if you want to use that word. In other words, they were manipulations of authority, of emotion, or of logic and reason. Uh, some of these make I think you can understand the the, the idea behind them. Certainly, uh, you can manipulate people's emotions if you try to um, uh, make them very sad by showing them pictures of hurt puppies or something like that before trying to convince them. Uh, that's not really a fair way of arguing. But some of the these unfair ways or, or sort of cheating ways of arguing, or sometimes they're just sloppy ways of arguing, are more specific than that. And we use the term fallacy to refer to this kind of argument, an argument that does not meet the standards of, of solid argumentation in, in the realm of either ethos, pathos, or logos, authority, emotion, or logic and reasoning. Now there's a good general overview and introduction to fallacies on pages 351 and 352 in your textbook. Um, and hopefully you've already watched the Love is a Fallacy video, which I really enjoy. It's sort of a humorous way of thinking about fallacies and the way they work. But I did want to go over some of these fallacies briefly because I think sometimes they can be kind of confusing to students. Hopefully some of the uh, the examples used in the, the film made it a little clearer to you. Uh, one of the problems, though, is that the film sometimes uses different terms to refer to these fallacies than the book does. I'll be using the terms that are on pages 351 and 352 to talk about them. So I just wanted to go over the different kinds of fallacies this book presents. And by the way, this is a very selective list. There's a lot more of these kinds of logical fallacies that, that sometimes show up in argument, but these are probably the most common. The first one is, oh, here we have another great Latin phrase, post hoc ergo propter hoc, which literally means after this or that, therefore because of that. And it's the argument that two things which, one thing which succeeds something else in time must have been caused by the first thing. And it's, it's, this is a, the kind of argument that, that is often used unintentionally. In other words, we don't set out to deceive people by using the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy, but, but we do sometimes fall into it without realizing it. And sort of the, um, uh, one of the classic examples would be um, if the, the, the belief that if you wash your car, it's going to rain. 
Um, the, sometimes it may rain after you wash your car, but certainly it's sort of silly to think that washing your car literally caused it to rain all over your neighborhood or all over your region. Um, most superstitions have to do with the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. The reason why we think that breaking a mirror will bring seven years of bad luck probably is that some day, some, some person a long time ago probably broke a mirror and then had a whole lot of bad luck afterwards and came to the conclusion somehow that the breaking of the mirror caused those later things to happen. Now those are sort of, uh, even on the surface, they're, they're absurd examples. But but sometimes the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy can kind of sneak up on you. Um, I know, for example, I had an argument with my mother one time uh, in which she was trying to suggest that um, most of the uh, sort of problems of modern society, and she listed things like high rates of drug abuse and high divorce rates and high teen pregnancy rates and high rates of illiteracy and childhood obesity, that a lot of those things, she said, were caused by women entering the workplace in the late 1960s and early 1970s rather than staying home with their children. Now, I disagree with the the sentiment here, but I also had to point out to her that that you can't make that kind of claim. Certainly you can say that um, there's there's the possibility of a connection. You could argue, for example, that um, divorce rates went up partially because people were – couples were spending less time together because the, the – both cut both – uh, members of the couple may have worked for a living, um, whereas they might have been, been able to spend more time together if one of them was able to stay home and take care of the house and the kids, etc. But that's not the same thing as saying the divorce rate is because women now have careers. Um, divorce rate is because of a whole lot of things, and you can't certainly peg one reason for what uh, what is a very complex social phenomenon. The same thing is true with history. Um, you've learned in your history classes, hopefully, that the Civil War was not fought over slavery. Well, that's not entirely true. It was at least partially fought over slavery. Some people were fighting because they um, didn't want to have to give up that system, that economic system, that cultural system. But there were lots of other things involved too, states' rights and tariffs and lingering resentment in the South over the prosperity of the North. There's just so many different things that contributed that you can't say that because one thing happened after something else, it must have been caused by that thing. The second fallacy that the textbook presents is the hasty generalization, um, which is the idea that that y- of making broad statements based on a very small uh, group of evidence. Um, so, for example, if I was to, um, uh, on my way to work, notice a student who passed me uh, on the road in a brand new Porsche, I might then argue to to the board of trustees, you know, we can raise tuition rates quite a bit because students obviously can afford much higher tuition. I saw one driving a Porsche just the other day. Well, the problem, as I hope you can already see, is that that's not a uh, substantial enough sample. One student driving a Porsche doesn't mean that all students can afford a higher tuition rate. So that kind of generalization is based on too little evidence to be sustained. The false analogy fallacy has to do with comparing two different things that can't really be compared. Um, uh, a good example is that a lot of people in the, the later part of the 20th century started drawing comparisons between the United States and the ancient Roman Empire, saying that the United States was this big, most powerful civilization on earth just as the Roman Empire had been uh, several thousand years ago, and that we had some similar social problems to the Roman Empire, and people would talk about declining morality and and um, d- uh, economic disparity and things like that, and they'd say that if we're not careful, we're going to fall just like the Roman Empire did. Well, there may be some similarities between the United States and the, the Roman Empire, but that doesn't mean that everything is similar about them. In other words, you can't say that because the Roman Empire was the most powerful civilization on earth and the United States is the most powerful civilization on earth, everything else about those civilizations is the same. The Roman Empire fell partially because they were invaded by, by barbarian tribes, and I don't think it's very likely that barbarian tribes are going to come invade the United States anytime soon, so the analogy breaks down at some point. The next fallacy listed is known in the textbook as either-or reasoning. Sometimes it's called the false choice or the false dilemma fallacy. It's where you give your audience only two options, one of which is clearly a bad option, 
so that the audience is sort of forced into um, the other side, which is usually your position. Um, the, the one in the, the textbook is, the example they give is, either you are pro-choice on abortion or you are against the advancement of women in our culture. And we could flip it around and say, either you're pro-life or you enjoy killing innocent children. Well, no one in Enjoys killing innocent children, and no one wants to be against the advancement of women. So, if you give the, if you present the issue in this way, it sort of forces the audience, whether they agree with you or not, into taking your position because the other one is so bad. The problem with the false choice or the either or uh, re, uh, fallacy, obviously, is that there are other options. It's possible for someone to be uh, to not be pro-choice, in other words, to be pro-life, but also be a feminist. And just like it's possible for someone to uh, not be pro-life, in other words, to support some kind of abortion rights, but still not not uh, want to kill innocent children. The next, exam- next fallacy given in the textbook is the ad hominem argument, and uh, that was one mentioned in the, the film specifically. The ad hominem argument is I mean, it's technically a fallacy, but it's so common that students often don't recognize it as a fallacy because you see it all the time. And it's the idea of arguing to the man, it's called, to the person, rather than to the issue. This you'll see especially in political campaigns. So two candidates will be disagreeing on economic issues, uh, for example. And rather than dealing with the issue at hand, one of the candidates will attack the, the the opponent. In other words, talk about the opponent's character or the opponent's lack of qualifications or something like that, which is, is a way of obscuring the issue that's really being discussed there. Um, the, the example given here is we should discount Senator Jones' argument against nuclear power because she has huge holdings in oil stock. Well, she may have huge holdings in oil stock, and that may in fact have influenced her position, but that doesn't mean that the position itself is invalid. In other words, uh, you, the, the, this person may may favor a particular position for lots of different reasons, but the, the, the position may be a strong position nevertheless. The next fallacy given is one that you are all familiar with, um, that one that you've probably bought into at some point in your life, but one which your um, your mother especially uh, is um, is very adept at seeing through. Actually, I'm going to break this up into two fallacies. They call it the appeals to false authority and the, and bandwagon appeals. I'm going to take the second one first, the bandwagon appeal. And this is the idea that because something is popular, because lots of people like doing it, it must be a good thing to do. And of course, your mother can see right through this. If if uh, if you present uh, an argument to your mother trying to convince her to let you. Uh, go to a concert or stay out late or whatever. I mean, this is obviously only valid for those of you who still uh, live at home with your parents. Um, and you say, well, lots of other people are doing it or all my friends are going here too. You know exactly what your mother's going to say. She's going to say what all mothers throughout history have said, which is if all your friends jumped off a bridge or jumped off a cliff, sometimes there's a variation, would you do it too? And And what your mother's really saying there is just because lots of people like to do something doesn't make it a good thing. Now, this is a problem for us in a democracy. It's difficult to avoid the bandwagon appeal sometimes because we like to think that whatever the majority of people want is a good thing, but we have to remember that at some point in our history, the majority of Americans favored slavery, and the majority of Americans um, thought that women should not be allowed to work outside the house or shouldn't be allowed to vote for that matter, and a majority of Americans uh, believed in segregation. All of those things had popular appeal, but they were later shown to be invalid positions. The other side of this argument, ironically, is the one that your mother is most likely to fall into, which is the false authority uh, argument. And the false authority fallacy is basically holding someone up as an authority on something that they're really not an authority on. Um, uh, If I said um, uh, we should withdraw all troops from Afghanistan, and I should know because I have a PhD in English, well, obviously a PhD in English does not qualify me to make military decisions. The way your mother falls into the the trap of the false authority fallacy is the because I said so argument. And I do this too. I'm not criticizing your mother because I I, uh, have kids, and so I I sometimes say it myself. Your kids ask you um, why they have to do something or why they can't do something that you won't let them do. Uh, It's sort of a natural response, because I said so, because I'm the authority, and I, I said you can't. Well, 
for kids, that's fine. But at some point, uh, as you get older, you start to question that argument um, because because I said so isn't a good enough reason for um, people who are nearing adulthood or past uh, past the age of legal adulthood, for example. So that's a false authority fallacy. It's holding someone, whether yourself or someone else, up as an as an authority on a subject that they don't really have the authority to to speak on. The next fallacy is the non sequitur fallacy, um, which is basically presenting. Um, something that doesn't follow logically. Um, this is a, a very broad kind of fallacy, and in fact, lots of different things can fall into it. The example given in the, the textbook is, I don't deserve a B for this course because I am a straight-A student. Well, the fact that you've gotten A's in all your other classes certainly doesn't indicate logically that you must get an A in the next class. Um, the Probably the, the better example, the one that I like to provide, is the, if you love me, you'll buy me a car or fill in the blank, I guess. Um, and the idea that somehow love must be uh, necessarily demonstrated by buying stuff for the other person, um, especially if we're talking about kids here, um, that doesn't hold up logically. And so it's an example of something that's presented as a logical conclusion that simply doesn't meet the standards of logic. The next one, circular reasoning, um, is uh, is – the idea is sometimes called begging the question. It's presenting the claim as if it's already been decided when, in fact, that's the thing you're trying to convince your audience about. And so, for example, in the textbook it says marijuana is injurious to your health because it harms your body. And you know, a careless reader might look at that and say, well, gosh, that makes sense. That's a good point. I guess it is bad for you. But the problem is – Injurious to your health and harms your body, those mean exactly the same thing. So basically what you're saying in this example is marijuana is bad for you because it's bad for you. Um, and, and that's that's not a uh, – obviously you haven't proven anything here. You've just sort of restated the original statement. That's why it's called circular reasoning because you're right back where you started at the end of the statement. The next one is the red herring argument. This may be a term you've heard before. Red herring is something that is sort of irrelevant, thrown in to throw off the scent. And we don't know exactly where the, the term comes from. But but um, the idea is that it's something you throw into the argument just to sort of distract your audience, to change the subject, to get them to think about something else. And the example – uh, in the textbook is, you raise a good question about my support of companies outsourcing jobs to find cheaper labor. Let me tell you about my admiration for the productivity of the American worker. And it's like you're sort of changing the, the issue so that you don't have to answer that first point or don't have to defend that, that, uh, that particular point that you're trying to convince the audience of. The last one we'll talk about is the slippery slope argument. And the slippery slope fallacy is the if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile fallacy. And this is another one that's very common in American society. Um, we often say, if you let, especially the government, if you let the government do this one thing, pretty soon they're going to want to do something much bigger that no one will like. Um, the argument was used uh, in the health care debate uh, most recently. Um, the argument has been used on both sides of the, um, the, the gun control debate uh, for several years. Um, the NRA will often say, you know, we can't outlaw automatic assault weapons because if you do that, pretty soon they'll take away all of our guns. And that you've heard that so many times that some of you may simply have accepted it as true. But of course, there's no proof that passing one law that's very restricted will necessarily lead to much greater restrictions later. It's kind of like saying, you know, we shouldn't have a speed limit because if you let the government tell you how fast you drive, pretty soon they'll try to take away your cars. And you know, I don't think any of us believe that the government's going to take away our cars just because we let them have have a set speed limit on on different roads. So the slippery slope, while some of you may believe it from time to time, does not hold up to logic. In other words, it doesn't make logical sense because you can't prove that one thing will necessarily lead to the next thing. All right, well, that's a pretty good um, uh, sampling of fallacies. It's about one, two, three, four, five, about ten of them, I guess, ten different fallacies. And you do have an exercise 
on the course page to complete regarding logical fallacies. Um, I don't want you to spend too much time worrying about logical fallacies. Certainly, I will mark them in your paper if I see them. I think sometimes it's enough, however, just to be aware of them. Some of these things you've never really thought about. In other words, you may not ever have thought about the reason why the slippery slope argument or the ad hominem argument isn't really fair or isn't isn't as effective as it could be. And actually, maybe effective is the wrong word because these fallacies can sometimes be very effective. In other words, they can convince an audience. But it's, it's convincing them with a cost. In other words, you're convincing them sort of by deceiving them. And that's, that's not a, uh, a good way to argue. If your audience sees through it, it will definitely harm your credibility uh, as an author. And so in general, you should try to avoid these kinds of fallacies. Um, but but don't, don't go into the public argument like with a microscope looking for any possible logical fallacies. Just be aware in general that there is a difference between good, solid, logical argumentation, and these kinds of, of cheats, um, shortcuts, um, unfair ways of convincing your audience that we call logical fallacies.